Welcome. I'm delighted that you're joining us today to hear some top tips to be more inclusive in your role as an academic tutor, lecturer, or trainer of people in your organisation. Um, brought together today, um, lots of different bits of information, but I'm delighted to be joined by um, Gabriella, uh, Gabrielle Cavella and also Fiona um, Fiona Truscott from UCL and uh, the Integrated Engineering Program. I don't know if you want to just stop sharing for a moment, Hayley, and invite Hayley, um, my names are all scrambled in my head, and invite um, Gabrielle and Fiona just to say hello and introduce themselves. Gabrielle. Uh, hi, uh, my name is uh, Gabriel Cavalli. I'm Professor of Science and Engineering Education at Queen Mary University of London, and I'm Director of the Centre for Academic Inclusion in Science and Engineering. I realise that actually uh, my yeah, my email is not on my slides, but I can, I, I'm easily Googled with my name. Fantastic. Thank you very much. It's brilliant that you've been able to find some time to join us today at what is a really, really busy time of term for you. Um, Fiona. Hi, my name is Fiona Truscott. I'm an associate professor with the Faculty of Engineering uh, at UCL and I'm, I work on the integrated engineering program. So I work at a faculty level instead of within a department. Um, within the Centre for Engineering Education, I am the student support framework lead. So this is my specialism. Um, and I lead a module called Engineering Challenges, which is our large first year, first term project work module. And I'm also co-chair of the special interest group on diversity, equity and inclusion for the European Society of Engineering Education. Fabulous. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted that you've been able to, to join me today. And I hope that everyone who's joining the call live or, or later is going to find, um, have some really important and useful takeaways to implement immediately and um, you're you're sort of able to get back into to the classroom or even in in meetings and we've produced a worksheet for you today which is uh, the the link is in the um uh, in the chat and please go ahead to, um over there and download it Haley, if you could start resharing the screen that'd be really great thank you I'm also really delighted to um, just to um, connect you with Helen Shipton, who's been working with Catalytic now for seven years. Um, Helen's going to be monitoring the chat um, and um, answering any questions, but also um, she loves to interrupt and make sure that I know what needs to be taken notice of. But um, equally important is Hayley Smith. Hayley's doing the technology today and uh, is also going to be doing some share screen sharing and also if um, anything goes wrong hopefully it will be sorted out and um, but also posting things in the chat as and when is required so thank you to both of you who've been involved in helping to bring this this webinar together and um, so i've got to remember which screen i'm just trying to change the slide okay um, just had a little bit of an issue with PowerPoint with the grayed out presenter mode. And so I'm doing remote screen sharing now. So today's webinar is about top tips to be more inclusive. Anyone who knows me knows that I'm about action. And over the last 13 years, been working um, a lot with UCL, but also with other universities as a visiting professor, looking at how we can tinker and tweak all that we're doing within engineering education to create a more inclusive space. And we've created our own methodology, which we call RISE. And I hope you don't mind, but I want to share a little bit more about the RISE methodology with you today, um, and also about the engineering inclusion forum that I've been crafting over the last five years. So the drivers for inclusion have now come from the very top, from the Engineering Council, but also have been translated, and I'm sure you're very familiar with AHEP. But I believe there are a few missed opportunities. I think we see communication being flagged up as really important as a professional skill. And when I do high performing teams workshops in industry, communication is one of the biggest things that they still ch are challenged by. So we need to think more about what communication is, 
but I'm not really heard. And please forgive me and tell, correct me if I'm wrong. What are we doing it, to improve and deepen what we understand by communication at every level of professional skills? What are we doing to make sure that we are developing really good, strong listening skills within um, our student population? And what models are you using? Let's give you some insights into that. Are we just talking about active listening, which is eye contact and head nodding? And does that really work? The second missed opportunity, I don't hear there being a lot of work being done, understanding the different cultural orientations that we have as individuals in all the different dimensions of our lived experiences. What are we doing to maximize the learning about different cultural experiences and nuances from our students and our colleagues? And again, what models are we using? And then number three, we're missing out on understanding the challenges that we as, as grown-ups, if you like, to be um, are fall into conflict because of personal differences, the different way that we're aligned to goals and objectives, but also conflict that arises in student teams, things that and how we as individuals and our personalities take criticism and respond to, to, to conflict. We'll click. So the challenges that we are facing in the uh, in the teaching environment is about peer judgment and discrimination, about how we are um, able to set the standards of behaviours between students, our expectations of them. We face challenges in terms of students who come from a low science capital background. Um, so students who've got one or two parents or even grandparents who've got science or engineering experiences, qualifications or just general interest have a very different conversation around the dinner table than students whose parents or families um, or if they're in care, the people that they're generally associating with have in terms of an interest and language around science, engineering and technology in the world around us. Neurodiversity is a catch-all for very many different um, conditions and ways of thinking and being. Some people are diagnosed, many are not. A lot of my friends have become been diagnosed with um, Asperger's, ADHD, uh, all sorts of different, um, different conditions because they've had their students go through a process of assessments. And the thing that I'm also really interested in is how our thinking styles and our speeds of thinking colour how people see us and per perceive how we they think we show up and how intelligent we may be. I'll talk about that a little bit more. So today's takeaway for you is your personal inclusion plan. Four pages unfilled, which is on the Google Doc. The link is in the chat. Please go click on it and, and download it. Um, the first page is for you to just capture some notes and thoughts as Fiona, Gabrielle and myself are talking. Um, and then some insights into the social identity model. And then on the back page is a framework for you to work through to use to introduce yourself in a, a broader way than you perhaps have ever done before using the models um, around social inclusion and then using the trust equation to help you build greater trust with your colleagues. So my journey um, to here today has come through doing contract research in a university, working in high tech manufacturing, commercializing science and technology at the business end, and then moving into the science policy end to do the same. So it's very much been around interacting with different people in different walks of life and um, translating deep technology into a way that end users and customers can use. I ended up working at the Department for Trade and Industry and um, leading the Women in Science Unit. And as a result of that, I've been involved in a number of high level national reports looking at initially uh, women in science, gender in science and then broader diversity in science. And I was also for a time the Royal Society, the very first diversity lead. And then I set Catalytic up uh, 19 years ago uh, next month. And we've been involved in researching and designing inclusion interventions and exploring and helping engineering educators to um, shift. But also through all of that learning is understanding more about teams and helping people in the private sector to develop and build high performing teams 
um, largely, as many of you who know us um, at Catalytic, a lot of that is using Clifton Strengths as one of our primary tools. In the higher education sector, my learning journey uh, really started at UCL before the integrated engineering programme, but then working alongside the development of that, running a symposium on in inclusive engineering and writing a report for the Royal Academy, and then creating my own models and frameworks around tinkering and tweaking to be more inclusive. I've been working with Christchurch Canterbury University on their course specification and then since, since then been a visiting professor with the Open University and um, and the and Teddy in, in London. Um, so the Catalytic Manifesto for Inclusion, which is on, on the website, it was some framing of my thinking around inclusion and a pushback from a lot of engineering educators against doing anything that was political correctness gone mad or, well, we're just technical. And so I flipped my um, and played around with uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and put excellence down at the bottom because everything in engineering is about creating a solution, a, an excellent product. And by criticizing the quality or the excellence or a gaps in something that's been designed is to criticize and hit at the heart of any engineer but it also allows a way to have a conversation with, how could we make that better? How could we make it more useful for different kinds of people? How could we tinker and tweak with it at the design stage, at pre-design stage with users to make it useful and usable for a wider group of people? And so the manifesto moves through different phases until we get to the top where everybody practices not as in because they're just practicing to get good at it, but actually inclusion and inclusive behaviors are embedded in everything we do, every, every way we think about science, technology, innovation, about the, the globe, the place that we live. So we're really being creative and innovative. Um, so this is a diagram from the, the uh, Designing Inclusive Engineering Education Report. Um, and looked at the different people along the pipeline of engineering careers and what it means to them to have diversity confidence. The RISE methodology was very much around that, how can we make a difference within the whole of engineering? And the big biggest blocker is the individual because nobody is ever going to do anything around inclusion unless they can see how relevant it is they've rationalized it stands for rationalize they've worked out what it means to them and when people connect to it in terms of the people they work with the students they teach the technology that they're teaching the solutions they're creating people suddenly go oh oh okay i get that and the next phase that is the i is the internalize because the next thing is well okay what can i do about it and the i is what today is all about be at each one of us taking one thing away that we can do to make a difference. The S is about strategize and the E is about externalizing and engaging other people in it. A little bit more of description. So if you want to know what it is, just take yourself a screen snip of that slide about rationalize, internalize, strategize and energize. And it really can be seen encapsulated in it's about safety and it's about making sure that we think about all sorts of different people when we're considering risk within the science and engineering endeavor. It's about the design process. It's about working together and collaborating and communicating as teams. It's about making sure that people feel welcome, both in terms of professionals, about having the right PPE to wear, but also in the spaces that we're working in or even designing. So it's about making sure that it works for you and that you're able to do the things that are meaningful to you to make an impact on those that you are working with and for. So what I want you to do is to start thinking about, I'm sure you're here because you've already figured it's something you need to be doing. What is it that you can do? How can you have noticed that grain in your shoe and actually stop and encourage and inter interrupt other people to say, yes, you could do something just a little bit different and we've been running the engineering inclusion forum we started over lockdown and we're running it as a 
a, a meetup space, which is a membership club where we bring people together and to work through four different modules that really helps us to tackle that rationalize and internalize and exploring in a really safe space how we can um, both generate inspiration for others and how we can integrate inclusion in, into what we do. Um, how we can think about cultural differences, how we can think about thinking styles, but also introducing models for thinking so we can interrupt the mental models that we have and just shift what it is that we're doing so that it's relevant and applicable both in education, but also in the application of what we do. So there'll be a link to that later. I just wanted to also flag up, though, about what we're thinking around and how get you to think and maybe add some some notes into the chat. Do you, how do you, what models do you use to consider cultural orientations? Now, some people have got a complex cultural orientation because they've got peer parents, grandparents, family um, that they have lived with in different countries where they absorb the culture which they are em embedded within. But I'm really fascinated with the frameworks like the uh, one from Erin Mayer, which is the culture map or the um, Yosso's um, framework as well, but it's around these different frames and lenses on how do we communicate? Low context, high context. And it doesn't matter whether um, where you are, but it's who are you with and are they higher or lower than you? Do uh, you give somebody for that example, particular example in Germany and America, very low context, you can give people um, very specific information and introduction and detail around things, whereas China and Japan are high context. But if you're from Germany or um, the America, which is the, the lowest of context, but everything gets spelled out and you're communicating and chatting with someone who's um, been brought up in the, the French culture, then they're higher context than you. So they don't want too much specific detail. They want to have a broader picture. They implicitly understand things so these kind of cultural frameworks what a rich soup we have in the higher education sector and in global engineering and technology where we can really just um be learn more about people but but also where are you from and how much are you able to flex and move and shift to solve someone else when when you need to it's great thinking and something we really need to do more about so one of the frameworks that we use in our workshops with, with leaders is the, the trust equation. Trust is such an implicit and important part of, um, of having, uh, of being a really strong leader. It's, um, and it's encapsulated in this equation of credibility, reliability, intimacy, um, which is allowing people to know who you are. And that's where we get to that, introduce yourself. But so soon as anybody gets a hint of self-orientation or self-interest, then trust gets torpedoed straight from the bottom. Um, understanding your own social identity helps you appreciate others. And on the second and third pages in your, your uh, worksheets, you've got a description of that. And I particularly like the this grid, this um, coloured grid from the University of Wisconsin, which has come from their staff training programme, but also, I was lucky enough to work on a National Science Foundation Aspires programme. Um, and the, the sort of way that you can then use that and create a grid to help understand where you are and where other people are is really important. and gives you a different language to talk about things. Um, so that's a little bit about me, about where we've come from. And it's about also um, just wanted to give you that context about how you can um, start using that the, the worksheet and start shifting where you are. And one of the things I'm hoping that people are going to be able to go away and do is, is think about how do you introduce yourself at the beginning of your very first lecture or module and set the ground rules for how you're going to operate. So that's enough, I think, for me for the time being. Um, so I'm delighted to um, hand over now to Gabrielle Cavelli, um, who will tell us a little bit more about what inspires and drives him to make a difference. Um, so uh, if we could stop screen sharing, Hayley, and let Gabrielle share his screen, that'd be wonderful. Um, let me know if you can actually see my screen. Yes. Okay. Okay, here we go. 
So I'm going to be sharing some reflections um, on inclusive education. The context is in STEM, but I think actually they're applicable to, to other areas. Particularly looking into things that we normally not consider when thinking of inclusivity. It's just like it, 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 in a bit of the original journey, particularly in STEM, is, you know, we've got uh, colleagues that sometimes say, well, what does inclusion mean when I have to teach about atoms or energy? You know, what, what is it that I can, in terms of actually working from an inclusive curriculum? And I think that um, uh, Jan actually touched on some of those talking about uh, uh, science capital, but also um, talking about, you know, what's, what's our end products, particularly in engineering uh, um, and how, you know, only a couple of years ago, they, they started using female bodied uh, dummies in the testing of, uh, of, um, of safety belts for, for cars. So lack of inclusivity there or lack of inclusion there um, it ends up in poor engineering and in poor science, and it's very important, therefore, that we actually bring those to the to um, the classroom. And obviously, the context is in terms of education, uh, um, the existence of unacceptable graduate outcome gaps, which also translates into lack of representation later on down the line, or contributes to it. And another gap that we talk less about, which is the gaps between qualification and skills, which actually is very well documented for STEM graduates in the UK particularly. And this poses another layer of exclusion on top of the others. You know, if a graduate, uh, um, um, graduate with a gap of uh, between what the qualification is and what the skills are. And I looked into this issue through a multidisciplinary lens with my colleagues, particularly the, the group that I'm actually showing here. And when I say multidisciplinarity, I mean really worlds apart. So, so we include social linguistics in, in, in underpinning and un unpacking uh, STEM education. And this enables us to cover a wide range of approaches to, to interrogate these issues, but a lot more importantly is to develop new ways of thinking about education through a multidisciplinary lens. Uh, we frame learning as an inclusion trajectory into a subject community of practice. Obviously, this one here is unrealistic because in reality, there is exclusion because of barriers. But even if we think of realistic, successful trajectories, they're often obstructed by hidden barriers. And these are central, particularly because they result in exclusion for some students. And what we don't uh, uh, reflect enough in STEM is that expertise expert language and ways of thinking and being in the subject, what we call scientific thinking and engineering judgment, are opaque for learners and become hidden barriers that actually need unpacking. The other thing that we actually do in this group is we ask ourselves inclusion into what precisely? As an educator, I actually find these depictions of equality and equity problematic because they're not really our aim. This is. You know, inclusion can't be spectator equity. So we have to review, if we want to be truly inclusive, what we mean by education. So we call this, represented here, academic inclusion. And I don't have the time to elaborate, but for now, think of it as inclusion in the subject. So as eventually a successful graduate in that subject uh, and, and practitioners. And in the process, we unpack expertise through social linguistic analysis, covering a spectrum that go from just vocabulary all the way to ways of thinking and being in the subject. Effectively, what we're doing is focusing on metacognition. And for me, it meant evolving from teaching polymer chemistry to teaching polymer chemists. And it was a subtle but impactful difference. Um, and I think metacognition is central for effective learning, but it's also what will keep uh, our jobs in future as well. So it's very important that we actually do the shift in education. And for me, social linguistics and language reflections has helped me develop strategies to teach and unpack metacognition in my subject. I think before I provide details about what this means, it'd be helpful to understand why and how we ended up here we started our, ref our journey of reflection in a transnational education program in China, where we teach material science and engineering in English to Chinese students, observing all sorts of issues 
that have to do with language. We can't avoid it. Um, and so it's very easy in that context to think that the issues that we observe are a problem of translation between English and Chinese. But on further reflection and wider observations made us realize that it's, you know, these issues were indeed a problem of translation, but not between Chinese or English, rather between Stemglish, a language in which no one is born a native speaker, and English as much as between Stemglish and Chinese. And so what are the issues with language and STEM? Is it just so-called technical English, uh, difficult words in the subject such as these? Well, we think not, because these are so different to everyday language, and they're also the focus of teaching, that they're self-flagging. Um, much more problematic are words like these, which have a slightly or very different meaning in everyday language, but which experts we use in different ways and do not necessarily explicitly teach what we mean by them. And I'll give you just one example for today. Error, which is central to STEM. And what we mean is a measurement of the variation in the data. But the everyday meaning of error is mistake. And I don't know you, but every time that I actually ask my students to name different types of errors, they always start with human error. And actually, you know, what is that about? If you as much suspect human error in your data, you ditch it. So it's not something that we should be focusing on at all. And it's as if the everyday meaning of the word is really dominating the learning of the STEM concept. I have no evidence, we haven't worked on this uh, precisely, but the prevalence of this issue is so high that uh, we think that something along those lines might, must be operating. And where's the wider uh, evidence? Well. Um, the wider evidence in, in, in school education is that attainment in school uh, science in the UK is profoundly mediated by reading comprehension and scientific reasoning, the latter that is never really explicitly taught. And it's a main mediator in uh, attainment or awarding gaps linked to socioeconomic status in science. There's no data that this is operating in higher education, but critically, that there isn't data to state it isn't. And why should it cease to operate magically at university? Particularly when the wider evidence is that 10% of students in England lack the basic literacy skills to succeed in their degrees. And this is literacy in English. Therefore, the student population, which might be just English literate, but not STEM English literate, is likely to be higher because one underpins the other. Okay, so what does it mean in practice to teach with this in mind. Well, first is a focus on metacognition, as I said, and for me, as I said, it requires uh, a transition from teaching the subject to teaching subject experts. Um, and this requires to become aware of these issues and being very intentional and explicit in our teaching. And partially is actually about sharing our own ways of metacognition. Uh, we start by paying attention to language as the first starting point with multiple meaning, and we have dissected it further between content focus, concepts with uh, multiple meanings, but still uh, the object of teaching, and practice focus, those which are more meta, about talking and communicating about other concepts. And uh, these are even more dangerous because they're central to feedback, but also professional practice. And we're not even aware how expert specific we are in their use and how students may not really understand what we mean. And, you know, when actually students write pages of an answer and we still tell them, oh, you haven't explained enough. When clearly it's not an issue of quantity, it means that we have a very subject specific understanding of the word explain that we must explain. And for me, this is illustrated by this um, figure here, showing that the issues are not uh, across about I don't know, Chinese or English, but about the stemglish English device. Native speakers of English may be operating in surface mode with, with their subject without you detecting it. And it's what, I, what I call Smurf talk. You know that Smurfs use the word Smurf for everything, but what does it mean? So you could say the Smurf was Smurfed Smurfily. And if you're talking to Smurfs, they will go, oh, yes, but you haven't a clue what you've just said. Well, some of your English speaking students, whether undergraduate or postgraduate or junior recruits, if you're in another context, might be smurfing in stemblish back at you. 
and it needs to be unpacked in order to support them. My latest and more complete intervention has been to push beyond words through a more holistic view of language underpinning thinking. So I actually teach in flip learning mode and I mark contributions in discussions there. And it's not marking for engagement, but students must engage to get marks. So indirectly, there is a, there is actually a push for engagement. And they get marks not for answering correctly any of, of the flip learning exercises, because that would be too onerous for them and for me and actually I assess content in another unit of assessment elsewhere. What I assess here is that in engaging with the material in discussions, are they expressing themselves like an expert? Are they thinking like an expert, framing questions, even if they don't have the answers, or if they're attempting answers, framing them in a way that an expert would do, regardless of whether they're right or wrong. And I provide very, very detailed criteria, and I can actually show you a bit of that later. And it's very easy to do it in class and provide instant feedback. So what are some of the results when I teach this way? Well, in this graph, every dot is a student, and the y-axis, we have the results in a module taught this way about the, their own student average in the same year. Black line is one to one. So you can see that most students in this program outperform their average across uh, the program, some of them quite substantially. And this happens for students with a third class average, that they can be pushed all the way up and in the first class, but critically in the 2-2 two, two, and 2-1 two, region, because these are central for reducing awarding gaps. And this is in China. So I have no data for ethnicity gaps, but we do have significant gender gaps in one of our programs, which was almost slashed in this module. And a bit more detail, in a main assessment, there is a question that assesses a core competency. And here are some results before and after implementation. The solid bars are the so percentage of students that obtain different uh, marks in that particular question, the solid bars before implementation, the stripe bars after implementation. And you can see a clear shift, particularly for students who were getting only partially right before, are actually pushed all the way up. And as I said before, there's a significant increase in engagement. This is data from online forum participation, which is not required. So this is not marked, by the way. And yet before and after, we have a substantial increase of times four after implementation, which has been sustained in 30 years. Um, so questions and answers to consider in this area. Particularly, because sometimes I actually speak and people say, well, I don't know where to start if I'm going to consider this. I'm not even sure if these actually issues are, are operating in my classroom. Well, if your students are not achieving a critical aspect of practicing your module and you've tried other things, have you, first of all, engineered explicit practice of those critical aspects in your class? And I would say very bluntly, if, you know, if you're not doing active learning in 2023, my first question would be, why not? Uh, but also, because actually, have you provide the opportunity for people to, for students in your class to really uh, give it a go in that critical aspect of your practice before it just appears in, a, in, in assessment? And if it's still not working, have you considered challenging the language that you use? And it's not to change it. And this is very, very important. You speak as an expert. You need to give the opportunity of your students to do so. So it's not you changing how you speak. It's unpacking the way that you speak. It's a completely different approach. Um, and have you finally considered being explicit about how you navigate difficult concepts as an expert? In STEM, we tend to focus very much on teaching the concepts and not teaching the ways of thinking about the concepts. And I've got plenty of examples, but I don't want to go on and on and on about it. We can discuss them later. So instead of insisting on trying to explain the concepts, have you explained how you think about the concepts that is in a way that is helpful to you? Because that might be a lot more helpful for, for your students than insisting on teaching the actual concepts themselves. And essentially, what I'm really trying to push here is a shift from teaching engineering, but you can put any other subject here, to teaching engineers. And be surprised about what you're going to see as a result. Uh, and I'm going to stop here. And uh, stop sharing where I stop sharing. <laughs> Well, wow, thank you, Gabrielle. Uh, I, I love that whole focus on language. 
and and I think language is so important and central to to the whole inclusion agenda in terms of where we think about things and and how the kind of the chimp in our in our head can grab hold of things and but also how we can absorb uh, material without thinking about without knowing that we've absorbed it and then it, it shifts how we act and behave um and how are you, have you been finding yourself having to keep practicing and working on your own change in your language and approach yes absolutely but particularly actually focusing you know i've had not bad results in actually teaching the subject uh but actually, the, the minute that I started focusing on teaching on behaviors within the subject, the subject is taking care of itself and the results are much better. I think we tend to be really, frankly, obsessed as scientists and engineers and actually teach my concept and actually teach the concept. And, you know, you can, there's only so much that you can teach, let's say, about quantum mechanics. Because actually, frankly, who really understands it? <laughs> and instead of actually teaching on how to deal with it, which is something much more important for a student in terms of, well, there are things that you're not going to understand here, but what is a useful framework of thinking about it that is much more relevant as a practitioner, for example. So shift, shift on teaching from the concept into teaching the behavior about it. Mm -hmm. Helping give people new mental models to, to yes. connect and engage. Yeah. Yes. Brilliant. Has anybody got any immediate questions for Gabrielle? Feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, we can pick those up. Um, anybody want to flag up with a hand who wants to speak? No? Okay. And then, well, I'm delighted to pass the baton over to, thank you very much, Gabrielle and Fiona. Um, Please share us your thoughts and insights and reflections on what you're doing. Yes, certainly. I apologise to begin with. Fresh, fresh as flu has already got me. So the slides were a sacrifice to, the, to induction week. Um, so I will just talk about what we're doing at UCL. So I'm going to give you a bit of a uh, background about the Integrated Engineering Programme to give you a bit of context of um, what we're doing and why. So the Integrated Engineering Programme is a teaching framework that runs across eight departments worth of, of students, uh, the vast majority of our undergraduate programs at, in, the, in the engineering faculty. And the philosophy behind it kind of encapsulated in the name, it's about integrating different bits of the curriculum um, and thinking through how we make something that gives students what they need to go out into the real world. So one of the things we integrated in is about skills learning and, and building space in to explicitly talk about skills learning. Uh, my particular specialism is teamwork because um, we have four modules that we run at a faculty level across the entire, uh, across those eight departments. Um, and uh, the one I run runs across seven. Everything is tailored to every department. As you can imagine, trying to get eight departments to agree on anything is a, a, a very tricky task. And I'm very pleased I joined after that bit was done. Jan, I'm sure, understands as she was there from the beginning uh, how that process went. Um, but my module is called Engineering Challenges. And the point of it is an introduction, not to what engineers know, but what engineers do, how they function as engineers in, in the, the real world beyond uh, university. So. It's in the first term, it's in the first year, um, and it is a project work module. We get our students to work, different departments work together on an umbrella project that we give them. It's very much an introductory process. Um, and so one of the things we realized when we were creating everything was we needed to give the students some explicit instructions. So following on from what Gabrielle said, you need to tell them how to work in a team. You need to tell them how to do a presentation. You need to tell them how to communicate. And we found that was very helpful for, for giving students structure around what they needed to do. Because, you know, you could come in and we could go do this project and you could just see them all sort of look at each other going, what do we do? How do we start? And that is very useful for those students who find those uh, um 
kind of activities difficult or uh, anxiety inducing I'm sure a lot of us the first time we attempted to speak in public we're like I don't know what I'm doing how do I even think about this you know some of our students are natural speakers most of them are not they are uh, they can be your typical maths physics science students who are not used to these kinds of things and they're not necessarily used to to talking to each other and collaborating on things so giving them you know it's fine to be uh, in conflict in your team we found that students thought oh, as soon as there's conflict oh no we've, we're doing bad teamwork you know and it's no it's just a disagreement as long as you resolve it that's fine so explicitly stating our expectations and, and that kind of thing rather than leaving students to kind of work it out as they go along is really helpful and, and remembering that they've come in so we've built in spaces so alongside my module engineering challenges we run one about skills called design and professional skills. It is, as it says on this tin, it's where we do the skills teaching, the specific skills teaching. Um, and so, for example, I work very closely with my colleague Chika, who runs that module, to ensure that when we're doing a presentation in my module, the week before there are presentation skills teaching. So the students come in knowing some information. So there's a lot of integration between them, between those different bits. Uh, one of the things we've we've really thought about is also structuring that journey through multiple years. Um, so I work with departments in second and third years to say, okay, we do the teamwork teaching right in the beginning, and we're just going to do the very basics. We're going to just talk about this stuff. And again, this is about walking the students through. So those students who feel anxious about these situations, who think about, you know, this this is a tricky, difficult Thing for them to do they're not being chucked in at the deep end they've got something to fall back on we also when we talk about teamwork we use we actually use strengths quite a lot so we get all our students do strengths in the at the beginning of um the year so do the strengths finder and um, they get their top five and we found that's really useful to provide students with a language so rather than saying ah oh, you never hand anything in at the right time you just never do it you can say okay your deadlines are important for you right <laughs> and it pulls it away from the personal and again that's very useful it's also very useful um in diverse teams so one of the important things to note about ucl is we have 50 to 60 percent of our cohort are international students so we have a very diverse cultural background of our students we have people from a lot of different areas um and we have uh it's quite an ethnically diverse student body as well we're about across the faculty about 30 percent women um, but that does depend on different departments as you can imagine biochemical engineering higher percentage of women uh, computer science lower percentage of women it does unfortunately confirm to the stereotype as much as we try to to shift it so in some ways our cohort is very diverse in some ways you know our entry requirement is triple a star for pretty much all of our courses so you can imagine that that does uh self-select for certain kinds of students that we've got there and we know for example resource correlates with achievement and particularly for our international students our fees are high you know realistically there are uh, that limits who is going to be part of our cohort so strengths is useful to allow students to talk to each other but we've started now addressing uh topics around international students and cultural context and really uh, when we talk about communication different communication styles we are still in the process I mean it's one of these things I think we're never going to finish developing but we've put those expectations on students to say actually some people are not going to be fluent English or you know are going to be have to think about it or they're not going to get your references and we do exercises with students to try and get them in the classroom thinking through these different topics uh, and, and stuff and again building on that through the years. So in the first year, it's very straightforward. It's it's not very detailed. And then when students have a bit more experience in uh, project work or working with other students or communicating with other people to say, okay, yeah, this is this is how we go forward and, and we can think a bit deeply. In terms of our assessments ourselves, we use like all the assessment types going. Um, uh, I am primarily a skills teacher, so I'm not a massive fan of exams, which I have to say I've always found very stressful, both as a member of staff and a student. Um, and so 
one of the things we do is a lot of coursework and, and as you can imagine the stuff that we can only assess by coursework but we have a balance of coursework and exams uh, um, part of the thinking behind that design was to ensure that not everything was on a single moment at the end of the year that we were actually banking some of the marks for the students and giving them some space and again trying to provide different if you're good at writing we've got writing based assessments if you're good at presenting or feel more comfortable presenting we've got those we use team assessments quite often on our project work which again we found kind of anecdotally can help students with anxiety or dyslexia for example um, working in a team rather than necessarily doing everything by themselves um, and we do a lot of collaborative, as Gabrielle said, are we active learning all the way, just all the way. It's useful in the classroom. I find it much more fun teaching personally, but we find that the students are able to ask each other and learn, each, learn from each other in that. So it feels less um, uh, like you have to understand what's happening in this moment. Uh, uh, but we do a variety. So we, we do a bit of everything, which again, is very helpful because if you're not a big fan of one thing you're not doing that for the entirety of your degree you're doing a bit of everything all the time uh, we also have kind of expanded the integration so one of the things we've we've been doing recently is we've started integrating other services within ucl so we have an academic communication center so rather than us trying to teach writing we bring in experts, we bring them into the classroom and say, these are the services available. We really expect you to be using them. Bring these people into the classroom. We also bring student well-being uh, into the classroom and, and get talking to them and, and work very closely with our student uh, well-being uh, colleagues in departments to say, this is what's going on in the module. Your students are probably finding this difficult. Um, you know, let us know if, if you think there are any issues, please do, you know, kind of keep that line of communication open. Teamwork is also a fantastic way for, for finding if any students are struggling because they don't turn up and the rest of their team tell you. Um, and so it's very helpful for us to be kind of being able to flag students who maybe need a bit more support. And we can talk about the, the different issues that, that people might have found in trying to do teamwork or the big learning curve that is moving into university. And then just the final thing I wanted to mention about um, from a European context, it's fascinating what the word inclusion means to different people. Um, so something we've been doing in the special interest group was trying to think through these different versions of what inclusion means. And, and actually uh, in different bits of Europe, it's almost solely gender. Uh, whereas in the UK, it's got a much wider thing. And it's very interesting that even that requires unpacking in the way that Gabrielle suggested that diversity and inclusion are very different to different groups of people. So yeah, if anyone has any questions, if anyone wants to know how to do any of the stuff that we've done, please do ask away. Brilliant. Thank you, Fiona, um, particularly in your challenging circumstances with fresh food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that you managed to to make it this morning. Um, yeah, I think your one of your questions, your your points about making use of Clifton Strengths, and one of the things I find particularly useful, and it really is a source of a lot of conflict, is when there's and there's there are a lot of the thinking themes um, that you can have in your top your profile with with Clifton Strengths, you can think some people think very much about well what happened not just like last year last week but they just love history and so everything is referenced about how did we get here not just in terms of the topic but they are the people in the class draw on them ask mm -hmm. them those questions really tap into get to know your students so as much as you get people who think way back to the dawn of time You've got people who lean way far into the future and are big blue skies thinkers. And so framing questions in class, because sometimes the big, big thinking thinkers aren't necessarily as present in your class as you may think. And you may notice them, uh, people who they're interested at first, but you say something that captures them and they're off. Their brain is in a different sphere. And they may, you may think they're not interested, but actually you can draw on them and say, um, 
I'm just thinking who's who's having some really big thoughts about what I've what I'm talking about. Um, or if you know they're a big thinker, plant some seeds and ask them to to come back later. But as well as the sort of like that time scale, there's also that immediate speed of thinking. Some Clifton strengths are people who've got always integrating what's happening in front or the creative idea and idea and idea people who don't necessarily string a coherent sentence together because they they topic jump very quickly they have lightning thinking conversely you have people who are come across as being very slow not contributing sofa surfing uh, really not necessarily in the moment because they've got something that Gallup labels intellection really deep thinking they just love to think and they won't respond in class because they won't talk until they know it's right and then you've got the people who've got analytical question 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 now sometimes you think they're asking questions because they don't understand but if they've got that with another strength of that gives them more confidence they will ask questions because they know other people don't understand and they ask questions because they do understand and so as a tutor, being able to, or as a lecturer, or whatever, in any walk of life, being able to kind of get that sense of where people are in their the dimension of their thinking can really be a valuable tool in giving you a different perspective on who's contributing and who's not. And if you've always got somebody who doesn't ask questions, plant them some things to go away and think about and come back next time. And that's had amazing results in places that I've been. Um, so... I mean, gosh, you both of you have covered such a broad range of the things and perspectives of what you do, but how we can shift our thinking from some really fundamental stuff from Gabrielle um, to to some very practical things that you're you're sort of wrestling with in your the huge IEP. And um, so, has anybody got any other? Are there any questions that have popped in the chat, Helen, that we should think about? Um, or does anybody want to put the hand up? Um, digital hands would be great and then you could unmute and actually ask some questions and some reflections I don't think there are any questions there must be some there some have come through as individual ones um, I'm just, okay, Phil I'll Collins on. Phil yes unmute and um, ask away Spotlight is on you Hi everyone. Um, yeah, no, I, I thought that was really interesting, Fiona. I've I've been watching what happens at UCL sort of over the years, um, so I know a little bit about it. But I was just wondering, from a, you know, we've been all focusing very much on the students. Have you had to do any work with the staff to make it work? Because I and that's one of the challenges we all face that the staff are as, as diverse in their thinking modes as students. And some of them are very adamant that their way is the, is the very best way to do it. Uh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> um, so we are somewhat lucky in that um, our, the academics that we work with, so just to kind of explain the model of how um, the faculty level uh, modules work, because it's a bit unusual, is we have someone at faculty level who runs the module uh, and kind of leads the module. But at department level, departments assign one to four people, depending on what's happening in the classroom and what hours people can do. Um, and they run the kind of department based bits. And I because I work with on an interdisciplinary one, I have groups of department people working together as well. So, yeah, it's a really good point on the staff side. Um, we're lucky because they are somewhat self-selecting. So we, we're not having to persuade, you know, the person who is adamant that I will only do lectures and I'm never doing lectures again. Um, luckily, uh, they kind of sit in their own modules in the departments for us. But what we do have, interestingly, is just different cultural processes between departments that is fascinating. Um, I mean, the bit I really like about my job that I imagine other people would find absolutely frustrating, but learner is in my top five, which Jan will explain why I love this, um, is finding out how these different processes work and then thinking through how you bring them together. Um, and what's fascinating is they usually have more in common than they have difference, but the difference are the big things that people remember. But it is on uh, part of a big chunk of my job is understanding how to persuade different groups of people, how to bring them together and, and understand where they're coming from and where we need to compromise on what 
we kind of need to do that makes more sense for them or for their departments. Um, but it is really interesting that that topic, and it it's an as well as with everything, it's evolving as we go along. And if you buy me a drink, I can explain exactly who is the most annoying if you want. That, that sounds like a, quite an intriguing cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do it too soon, though, Phil, because Fiona's a bag of germs at the moment. <laughs> yeah, keep, your, keep them to yourself. Yeah, great. Thank, thank you for that, Phil. Um, great, com great question. Um, anybody else got any, would like to jump in and ask a question? Before I, I'm going to push you all on to do some work in a moment. Um, so, in the um, what I've now got for you, I've put it, reposted the um, uh, worksheet, which um, it's in the chat. The it's a Google Doc which you can click on. And there's quite a few people that have gone in there already. And um, it's one of the things that for me I think is really important is about how you do that welcome at the beginning of term, how you um, set out who you are. I showed you and in, in the worksheet on, I think it's on page two, is the uh, the trust equation. And one of the most, one of the easiest ways to start developing and building trust with somebody is to, if you know, familiar with the Johari window, is to widen what other people know about you, to share a little bit more. Now, some of us are incredibly in private individuals and really only share in little, little bits of people as we really feel that we know and understand somebody. Um, so being able to share a bit more about who you are, where you come from, what drives you, what motivates you, starts to let people know that you kind of understand, but also to what you care about. So on that worksheet, um, we've got, um, I hope you're jotting things down on the, purple in, on the personal inclusion plan, page one. Um, but when you're doing that, uh, if you scroll down on the document, um, you, I'm encouraging people to think about how you introduce yourselves, about why are you there? Um, so maybe as an example, you could start off with that very first words. Don't just say, hi, I'm, hi, I'm Phil Collins and um, I'm an amazing engineer. But actually, what is it you expect from them? What are you offering them? What is the, the takeaway? So here's an example I just crafted if you grasp each opportunity available to you at the end of this module course program you will have made new friends for life developed important professional and life skills and created some great stories to share at your future interviews and part of this includes how to connect to collaborate and possibly navigate conflict or differences of opinion with others in a constructive way so have a go at writing your own then introduce yourself i am i am phil collins Sorry, Phil, hope you don't mind. And it's my mission to support you to become a capable engineer, to really become, really picking up here on Gabrielle's frame around, you're not just teaching polymer chemistry, you're teaching polymer chemists. Um, so what I want you to do is just go and have a, just spend a couple of moments and think about how do you introduce yourself? And then I'd like to invite a few people to have a share of theirs. Go on, Fiona. Go on, Gabrielle. How do you introduce yourselves? And then frame it in the way of your expectations from them about getting the most from the cl your class. And that is around, I think the second one is around what are the challenges you've experienced, but what's their expectations of behaviour in class about helping each and every other person in that class be their best and show up. And maybe to even create a class charter, but I'll leave that to you. Anybody got any questions about being made to do some work? Jan Abel had a question just before you started this oh, section. Yeah. Came on, he came off mute, but I couldn't oh. find my hand to uh, attract your attention. Oh, you bye, can... Sarah. She may have already gone. Um, Abel, what's your question? Do you want to unmute? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yes, I've um, unmuted. Uh, yeah, my, my question was directed at Gabriel. I, I wanted to know, like, uh, he has made some changes to... Uh, improve, uh, let's say, the translation from STEM English to uh, natural English or natural Chinese. What I was thinking at the back of my mind is uh, between teaching uh, in the UK and teaching in China, say the same subject area, did, did you make any material changes to take into account 
any cultural differences? Um, no, but we are working in the team uh, on that, actually, particularly on supporting our Chinese students to adopt active learning because they are traditionally resistant. They come from a system of like quite even repetition when they start learning the language and learning you know, uh, Chinese characters by memory. They, so if you get your Chinese students asking you how many different words I need to learn per day, that, that's because how, that's how they learn their own language at school. And so that, that background, actually, they bring it, obviously, at university. Uh, so not particularly me, but people in my team are actually working on that. I think it's important to reflect that, you know, first of all, you know, the, the language aspects uh, in terms of vocabulary is a starting point, but it has translated into language underpinning thinking, so really, and, and behavior and communication. As, as, as tools rather than just isolated words, but it starts with isolated words. And finally, uh, is the fact that, um, yeah, it's, in a way, I have not worked with, uh, with uh, transcultural issues, mostly because I'm trying to focus on what happens with inside the subject, regardless of what your first language is. So, so ways of being and thinking and communicating in, in that particular subject that no learner, just wherever they come from, uh, is going to bring with them in the classroom because it's a different language to them. Uh, so, so I haven't done it necessarily. And uh, uh, yeah, and actually the shift is not that, it's not that I spend hours and hours and hours just talking about um, language and vocabulary and words. It's a much more organic way of shifting it. So you, so you can still use the same material, but it's about the awareness of what you're doing and how you communicate that and how you put it center stage in different points and different, also different types of assessment that is actually critical. But it's not that you have to like drop everything you've done before and, uh, and, and sort of like become start talking just about words and nothing else um it's a lot more organic i don't have the time but i can i'll, I'll be happy to meet up separately and 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 uh, work around it with with you brilliant thank you thank you very much for the great question and great response as well and one of the um things um that my brain has just jumped onto something else completely um and um the sort of was like, oh goodness, how can I do that? It's, I do it all the time. Um, so I, has anybody else got any questions? Um, do you want to unmute, or is any is anybody working hard on creating them uh, their their introduction paragraph? And I'm also interested if people are finding that a useful framework. Fiona, how do you introduce yourself at the beginning of a module or course? I actually have an entire lecture where we do this on my module called The Kickoff, where we introduce the module itself because it's a bit unusual for students. They, We do still kind of have to tackle the stereotype of expecting to come in and just be told information. Uh, so we have an entire lecture. So we talk about why it is important to know how these processes work uh, and then our expectations for the students on that module. Uh, and so I explain who I am and, and the fact that you won't see me in the classroom, but you'll see me pop up every so often to just sort of tell you things. <laughs> mm -hmm. Brilliant, wonderful. Gabrielle, how do you in introduce yourself? Actually, well, if I think of me teaching in China, you know, there are other issues there that have not to do necessarily with the students or even with the university, but the fact that parents are part of the institution you know we have a vice dean for students that should be called vice dean for parents uh, and uh, while in the uk very easily to sideline parents coming in all the time with you know by data protection i can't speak to you uh, um, we can't do that in china and so i'm a bit guarded in that respect and that's not because of the students or my colleagues but because of the parents uh, because it's just it's quite frantic but in general when I actually you know I didn't have the, the, the time today and I wasn't actually in face to face but I would for example read why because I discovered last year that I was neurodivergent and uh, and that actually you know it, particularly in a short um, 
uh, in, in, in a short timed presentation, I can't cope. And actually, I just realized I'm not an actor. And actually, I have acted, and that's not a problem. But this is a completely different thing. So actually, you know, I shift. I think that the important thing is what I have to say rather than whether I'm performing and being able to do it, you know, off notes. And so I talk about that uh, quite explicitly at the beginning of, of presentations, for example. Um, and, uh, and, and the fact that I'm openly gay man and that I come into inclusion from a, uh, um, uh, into um, sectional approach also being uh, um, an immigrant. And so that all those layers really inform well, my interest in language, my interest in, in, uh, in diversity and inclusion, and, uh, and my interest in ways of thinking, because my way of thinking, it's really not linear. And sometimes I struggle to, you know, bring it down to like A to B to C to D, because I don't think like that at all. I think in 3D, boom, in bursts. And then if you ask me to start somewhere, you know, it's just, I don't know how to get to your linearity or your expectations of your linearity. It's really, really difficult for me. Um, so, yeah. And, and, and yet releases all sorts of creative thinking and creative approaches. Yes, but it's not that straightforward to communicate to people who don't think like that. Really, really complicated when someone says, oh, explain this to me in a sentence. <laughs> that's one that's when it's just like, forget it. Let's go to the pub and get, you know, drunk, actually. We'd be much more productive. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And the, when I was talking before and I couldn't remember what I was going to say, and, and one of the your response to to Abel was was um this was an idea actually that came from um a, a, a friend of mine Dawn Fit and she teaches in further education and they have students where have come from all sorts of different backgrounds and some have done um lots of maths and physics before they've come and others have just come straight in to do engineering and it's also layered with some feedback from one of the very early years of of the integrated engineering program where students didn't want to do the face-to-face -face meeting they were using skype if you remember skype and they said they found it really helpful because the students whose english was not their first language were able to ask a question and somebody else would would respond to them so dawn dawn fit has every year she has a course uh, dictionary hosted on i think google docs and they people can put a word in they don't understand or a term they're not sure of and it's anonymous because they they're all in google it's all the different creatures that they assign to you and people then can edit it and it's a kind of like having a wiki i suppose where you create your own rich source of knowledge and data and so it becomes this kind of binding document that that course owns it's not about reproducing it and giving it to next year next year's student cohort because it'll save time. It's actually about another way of developing that bond between people. Um, so um, the I just wanted to, um, I think hopefully people, have, has anybody done the worksheet or looked at the worksheet whilst we've been chatting? I'm not marking you, there's no assessment. <laughs> but it'd be interesting to hear some of the, um, anybody's thoughts around um, how useful that was and what your takeaway is from today so people want to um so nobody's putting hands up to respond but if you do want to contribute and share your par your any of your intro paragraphs adrienne will do adrienne unmute yourself and join us hello hi uh it's a really interesting discussion because my first language isn't um english either and uh, i have a problem with uh the word engineer to start off with, because in my language, we have several words for a different level of engineers, while here in English, we only have one word for everyone. So uh, I really, really enjoy this discussion. Um, but uh, as, as you know, Jan, I'm, a, I'm only a visiting professor, so I'm not a full, fully fledged academic and I work in industry and I work in a very uh, industrial um, area um the ass we are the, the ass end of every process uh we do vacuum pumps and air blowers and i find the language barrier sometimes a problem with even academics and industry so this um introduction sheet that you uh, just taken off <laughs> oh, yeah. is really quite useful because um 
the way our, our, our industrial um, advisors and uh, VPs tend to, we tend to use more industrial language rather than uh, the the fluffy academically um, high vocabulary language uh, and I think that is um, somehow endearing to the students because we speak a simpler language if that makes sense mm -hmm. and uh, therefore the relationship when we do teamwork is very different uh, than from the academics um, and, and that's something I noticed irrespective of whether the student is international or, or a domestic student. Mm -hmm. Nice, no, thank you. So and being a visiting professor it's something you advocate to everybody, everybody to to adopt an, a, an industry person as a visiting professor. Absolutely, yes. For this reason, not just for this reason, but this is this has been a very interesting observation that, particularly when we're working in in teams, how our language is different from the academic supervisors. Brilliant. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Um, so, just wondered then if anyone's got any takeaways that there. What are the actions are they about to? Uh, what actions are you going to take when you go back to your office? And um, I've I've put a couple in the the chat. Oh, keep clicking too many times. Oh no no oh no I've done that. Uh, here we go. And um, so I've got a there's um a couple of top tips that I was going to share was was really about getting to know your students, establishing clear expectations, and setting those expectations for behaviours. Um, and and then making sure that diverse perspectives are then incorporated in, into your curriculum, setting that in your introduction, but also reminding people about creating that safe and respectful environment um, so that the culture is respecting difference and it's not just making assumptions, but knowing that whenever we bring different people together, we have different perspectives and that those perspectives are all valuable contributions. And I think really picking up well, I think on on both speakers around the multiple learning pathways and those different like learning styles and and abilities and capabilities. So those are mine to share. So Fiona, um, what's your top tip of action that you're going to take away today? Uh, I'm going to think a bit more about the specifics of language. So we unpack skills, but then uh, how do we explain those skills to students? I um, have just started working on a very interdisciplinary project module with art students. And I realize the word prototyping means something very specific in engineering. It means nothing to someone in the humanities. <laughs> so again, I think it's it's that thinking about what your norms are. Yeah, nice, brilliant, thank you. Gabrielle, you got any takeaways today? Or yes, actually, um, uh, particularly, you know, you know, I've been challenged to rethink about how I can present myself in ways that I don't have to be that guarded, even in, in a challenging environment that actually uh, um, establish, a, yes, it sets the tone for a complete different interaction with students. And I think that that's important, particularly important for the approach that I, that, that I have, you know, because we want students to be interactive and therefore to, to feel um, um, that they belong. So I think that in a way, I've been working, we've been working too hard in actually the aspects of what comes hidden into the subject, but it's important then to sort of like step back and incorporate the like wider aspects of belonging that are much more social and less actually subject specific because they go hand in hand. And uh, and so having sort of work hard in developing the, the, the subject specific ones, sort of like step back and, and working on the wider uh, belonging is important for me. Brilliant, thank you. Um, anybody got any actions or that they're going to take away to to do? Um, in if you, we'd love to know that you've got that's an action that you're actually going to take forwards. Everyone takes time to sleep, to sleep, to type. Um, so and then just as to really finish off, I just want to um, remind you. I mentioned earlier that we have the Engineering Inclusion Forum, um, which is a space, it's like a membership club we meet uh, at regular intervals, um, which is a safe space to learn and explore and practice um, the different ways to, to address inclusion. We look at different frameworks, some critical thinking models, 
um, we look at culture and the cultural frameworks that you can use and introduce um, different strategies that we can uh, help students to, to, to listen more deeply. Um, so there's um, Otto Sharma and Oscar Trimboli are two of our favourites. Um, and so in particular, she says, reaching for her book, um, there's, there's the culture map from um, the um, from Erin Mayer we like, and then how to listen, which has got five different levels of listening and talks around listening villains. Um, and so we we these are the, all the sort of tools that we introduce and talk around and practice and have great deep conversations around inclusion. So if anybody's interested in learning more about the Engineering Inclusion Forum, then please just put yes in the in the chat, and then we'll go through and. Um, and send you a link to find out more or book a call. Um, always interested in talking to people. Um, and um, they, there's also um, Helen's put links to find out more about the Engineering Inclusion Forum into the into the the chat. Um, so I think has anybody got any other questions that they would like to? Let me stop sharing. Um, brilliant. Anybody got any other um, any questions or thoughts um, that they'd like to flag up? everybody's quiet brilliant but I'd just take the opportunity to express my huge thank you to to both Fiona and to Gabrielle for taking the time out of this incredibly intensely busy week I uh, really appreciate it I love talking to both of you we've had many interesting conversations over the years and um, so thank you for joining us and thank you for everybody else who's been able to join us and those who um, had to dip out for another meeting um, it's been really amazing to, to connect and hear hear from everybody um, and I don't know that anybody's ever been um, not not enjoyed a meeting that finished a little bit early. So enjoy the 15 minutes you've got back, 10 minutes you've got back of your your life, your day, your lunchtime. And um, and thank you very much for joining us. Have a enjoy the rest of the week and have a fabulous weekend. Cheerio.